Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I want to cover nutrition. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below. So let's get started. First question. When doing a nutritional assessment of a low-income family, the community health nurse determines the family's diet is inadequate in protein content. The nurse suggests which of the following foods to increase protein content with little increases in the food budget. One, oranges and potatoes. Two, potatoes and rice. Three, rice and macaroni. Four, peas and beans. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answers for pea, uh, beans, peas and beans. Peas and beans are um, peas and beans are great sources of protein, and they're not expensive. So for a family that's on a budget that needs protein source, but something that's not expensive, these are great options. Okay, um, something else that's a good source of protein, not too expensive, eggs, as well. Let's look at other choices. One, oranges and potatoes. Um, those are good sources of vitamin C, not so much for protein. Two, rice and potatoes. Those are carbs. Three, rice and macaroni. Those are carbs. So that's why number four is your correct answer. A client is suspected of having a fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. To assist the client with this deficiency, the nurse informs the client that one, more exposure to sunlight and drinking milk could solve your nutritional problem. Two, eating more pork, fish, eggs, and poultry will increase your vitamin B complex intake. Three, increasing your protein intake will increase your negative nitrogen imbalance. Or four, decreasing your triglyceride levels by eating less saturated fat would be a good health intervention for you. And so guys, the correct answer is one because remember what they're asking us about are fat soluble vitamins and fat soluble vitamins are our ADEC, A D E K. Okay, so to get um, A vitamins A D E K, all of those vitamins can be found in milk except for vitamin D. So your vitamin A, your vitamin E, your vitamin K, those can be found in dairy products such as milk. But vitamin D, guess where you get your vitamin D from? Sunlight, those sun rays give you the vitamin D, okay? So there are two things you really have to know to be able to answer that question. One, what are my fat soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K? And number two, what are my sources for fat soluble vitamins? A, E, K, you can find in dairy products such as milk, but vitamin D, that is found in the sun. The sun rays, that's what gives you your vitamin D. And by the way, guys, vitamin D is needed for absorption of calcium. Next question. The client's diagnosed with a malabsorption syndrome, also known as celiac disease. In teaching about the gluten-free diet, the nurse informs the client to avoid one, citrus fruits, two, vegetables, three, red meats, or four, wheat products. The correct answer is four wheat products. Now, gluten is found um, in food sources such as wheat, barley, oats, rye. So anything that contains those um, ingredients, the patient has to stay away from. Okay, and the famous test question that they love to give when it comes to celiac disease or crackers, all right? Anything that has weeds, barley, oats, rye, patient has to stay away from. They cannot have anything that contains gluten. Next question, the school nurse suspects that a junior high student may have anorexia nervosa. This eating disorder is characterized by one, a lack of control over eating patterns, two, self-imposed starvation, three, binge purge cycles, or four, excessive exercise. And I'll give you a moment. The correct answer is two, self-imposed starvation. So that's what happens when the patient's anorexic, they will not eat. Now, when it comes to patients that are um, females and adolescents that are anorexic, 
a lot of this really stems from lack of control. So what happens is they feel like they have no control over their environment. These, these patients tend to be very high achievers. They tend to be, you know, president of student council. They tend to be the head of the volleyball team. They had to be the, tend to be the head cheerleader. They're very active. They're very involved. They get great grades, right? Their whole life is planned for them. Their parents have already decided what college they're going to go to. So much is expected of them. They're expected to date, you know, the football player, whatever. They feel like, they have no control over their lives. But one thing that they can control is their body. And so that's how you know you, you see that being manifested in them not eating. It's them getting a sense of control. So when it comes to this question, asking about this disorder, you're gonna see self-imposed starvation. And that's a form of them getting control that otherwise they felt they never had. Let's look at our other choices. You have one a lack of control over eating patterns. Uh-uh. Those patients with anorexia, they have the opposite. They have a lot of control over their eating, okay? They will not eat a thing, okay? They're not up and down, up and down, eat, don't eat, eat, don't eat. They won't eat, okay? Then you have your third choice, binge purge cycles. Now that's your bulimic patients. And there's, let me explain the big difference between the bulimics and the anorexics. Those patients who have anorexia, they tend to be underweight and they won't eat. They'll starve, okay? They're very strict with that. Those patients with bulimia, they'll go through a cycle where they'll um, binge. They'll eat, 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 eat. Then they feel guilty and then they'll purge. They'll either purge by vomiting or they'll purge by taking a whole bunch of laxatives, going to the bathroom, doing a number two, or both. And something else they'll do, or they'll binge, feel bad, and then try to do a whole bunch of exercise in between. And those patients who are bulimic tend to be either normal weight or just a little bit overweight, okay? That's the two of the biggest difference between your um, anorexic and your bulimic patients. The anorexics tend to be underweight and they won't eat at all. They are very strict on not eating, the bulimics tend to be of normal weight or just a little bit overweight, right? But they have cycles. They'll eat, 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 feel guilty. They'll be like, oh my gosh, what did I do? And they'll purge. So they'll binge, then purge. Binge, then purge. Okay, so we know number three couldn't have been the answer. And four, excessive exercise. Excessive exercise, you can see that in either or both, okay? You can see that in the patient who's anorexic, who's not only are they not eating, they're exercising excessively, or you can also see it in the bulimic patient who's binging then purging, pinging, binging then purging, and having um, excessive exercise in between. So your correct answer for the anorexic patient is number two, self-imposed starvation. A client's pregnant for the third time. In regard to her nutritional status, she should one, limit her weight gain to a maximum of about 25 pounds. Two, approximately double her protein intake. Three, increase her vitamin A and milk production consumption. Or four, increase her intake in folic acid. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is four, increase her intake of folic acid. Why? Because we know the damage of folic acid deficiency is so bad, right? What can happen? Baby can end up with neural tube defects. They can end up with all types of neurological complications, okay? Let's look at our other choices. One, limit her weight gain to a max of 25 pounds. Um, depending on the mom's uh, current weight, you want her to gain weight about 20 to 30 pounds, so it just depends on the mom's weight but we're not gonna put a max of 25 pounds. Two, approximately double um, her protein intake. When a mom's pregnancy, she needs about 60 grams of protein per day. So we're not gonna say double, we don't know what mom's was before, but for pregnancy, we do want them to intake getting about 60 grams. Uh, three, increase her vitamin A and milk production uh, consumption. Uh, for that, for her vitamin A, and milk consumption where she'll get the calcium. We see that in the prenatal vitamins, but you know, that's, even if it was a choice, cause technically it could be a choice, but number four is still the best choice. Cause if we're choosing between vitamin A and milk and uh, folic acid, it's gonna be folic acid 100%. 
who wants their baby to be born with no tube defects? So that's very important. You're gonna teach them about increasing their folic acid consumption. The nurse should offer a client who's had throat surgery which of the following? One, chicken noodle soup. Two, ginger ale. Three, oatmeal. Four, hot tea with lemon. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, guys, is two, ginger ale. So let's talk about this. This patient just had surgery, throat surgery. What kind of diet do you think they're gonna be on? They're gonna be on a clear diet. We need to know if that patient's bleeding, we need to know if they're bleeding. We need, if they vomit, we need to look at that vomit and be able to say, oh, I see pink, I see red in there, right? We want them on a clear liquid diet. One chicken noodle soup, that's not a clear liquid diet. Um, Three, oatmeal, that's not a clear liquid. Four, hot tea with lemon. Here's the thing, hot tea, that is clear liquid, right? But they just had surgery. Do you wanna give them anything hot and cause them to be burned? No, we're not gonna do that. So that's why four is not the answer. You're gonna to stick to number two, ginger ale, okay? Ginger ale is clear. That's the only choice that you can give the patient. And let's go back to number four. The hot tea with lemon, not only is it not clear, I, excuse me, the hot tea with lemon, it is clear, but not only is it hot, so we don't want to give that to the patient, lemon. That patient just had throat surgery. Do we want to give them anything with citrus in it? No. Why? It's going to hurt them. It's acidic. Think about it. So our only choice is ginger ale because it's clear, it's not acidic, and it's not hot. It's not going to burn the patient. Which of the following should the nurse do when introducing a, a feeding to a client with an indwelling gavage tube? One, irrigate the tube with normal saline solution. Two, check to see that the tube's properly placed. Three, place the client in a supine position. Four, introduce some water before giving the liquid nourishment. And I hope you guys chose two. You better check placement. So guys, if it's the first time that this patient's getting a feeding after this tube's been in place, how are you gonna check placement? You're gonna check the x-ray. You're going to make sure that it's in the proper spot. But if um, this is a subsequent feeding that you're giving the patient, how are you gonna check placement? You're gonna pull and check that gastric residual, right? You wanna make sure that it's where? In the stomach. So you expect to see that pH to be very low because you want it to be very acidic. You expect it to be between zero and four. You know, some textbooks might may, may, maybe say 4.2, but around that range, you want that residual to be very, very acidic. That's how you know you're in the stomach. A client seen in the outpatient clinic for a follow-up of a nutritional deficiency. In planning for the client's dietary intake, the nurse includes a complete protein, such as one, eggs, two, oats, three, lentils, or four, peanuts. And the only correct answer here is number one, eggs, okay? Eggs are a great source of protein and they're complete proteins. Next question. When assisting the client who practices Islam or Judaism with meal planning, the nurse knows that both religions share an avoidance of A, alcohol, two, shellfish, three, caffeine, or four, pork products. And I'll give you the answer. The correct answer is for pork products. Both um, patients that are Muslim, patients that are Jewish, they do not eat pork products. Okay, let's look at our other choices. You have one, alcohol. Um, the Muslim patients, patients who follow Islam, they do not consume anything that is alcoholic. Two, shellfish. Patients that are Seventh-day Adventists, they do not eat any shellfish. Three, caffeine patients who are Muslim, who follow Islam, they do not um, um, just any caffeine. So the only answer choice here for both the Jewish religion and the Muslim religion are pork products, okay? Those who follow 
Judaism, Judaism, I can't speak today, Judaism and Islam, neither one of them, they will not take anything that has pork in it. So four is the correct answer. Which of the following would the nurse expect to see offered or full liquid diet? One, custard. Two, pureed meats. Three, soft, fresh fruit. Or four, canned soup. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So what would you offer to a patient that is on a full liquid diet? And the correct answer is custard. Okay, custard falls in the full liquid diet. Let's look at our other choices. You have pureed meats. Pureed. Guess what? If it's a pureed meats, that's a pureed diet, not full liquid. Three, soft, fresh fruit. What kind of diet is that? High fiber. Fruits are very high in fiber. What is high fiber? Vegetables, right? And then four, canned soup. That would be your mechanical soft diet. So your correct answer is number one. During an enteral tube feeding, the client complains of abdominal cramping and nausea. The nurse should one, cool the formula, two, remove the tube, three, use a more concentrated formula, or four, decrease the administration rate. And the correct answer is for you want to decrease the administration rate. What you want to do is slow down that um, infusion. And what happens is when you slow it down, that cramping and the, the nausea should subside because usually what happens is it's just going too fast. It's going too fast. The patient's body can't handle it and they start cramping up. They get the abdominal pain. They feel nauseous. They feel like they want to throw up. So what all you got to do is slow it down. Let's look at our other choices. One, cool the formula. If you want that patient to start cramping up on you, go ahead and cool that formula. Absolutely not. You want the formula to be given how? Room temperature, okay? Two, rem <laughs> remove the tube. Oh, we're playing doctor now? Absolutely not. They have cramp, but you're not gonna remove the tube. You're just gonna slow it down, the infusion. Three, use a more concentrated formula. Actually, another reason, um, Aside from the infusion going too fast, another reason that that patient can have that cramping is that if the, the solution is too concentrated. So sometimes when it's too concentrated, it may um, need to be diluted. So you definitely not going to give a more concentrated because more concentrated is going to just give the patient more cramping. So that's definitely not the answer. Correct answer, you want to decrease the infusion rate. A client's diagnosed with peptic ulcer and has come to the primary health care provider for a follow-up visit. The client asked the nurse what foods are safe to add to his diet. An appropriate response by the nurse is to inform the client that which of the following may be added to the diet. One, citrus juices. Two, green vegetables. Three, frequent glasses of milk. Four, unlimited decaffeinated coffee. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is two, guys. The patient has a peptic ulcer. Let me explain something to you before I even go into this. So your stomach produces hydrochloric acid. Whether you eat or you don't eat, your stomach is constantly producing this acid. Now, when you eat, it produces more acid because your stomach sends a signal to your, actually the other way around, your brain sends a signal to your stomach and says, hey stomach, I just ate something, so I need you to go ahead and shoot out hydrochloric acid so you can break down the food. So when you eat, the stomach produces more hydrochloric acid, but your stomach's always producing hydrochloric acid, right? So now we have a patient that has an ulcer. They got a hole in the gut. What kind of foods can they eat? Well, I'll tell you what they can't eat, what you want them to avoid. You want them to avoid anything that will cause them to make more acid. You, um, you want them to stay away from anything that will increase the acid in their stomach. Let's look at these choices. One, citrus juices. Citrus! Citrus is what, guys? 
acidic, right? So we don't want that. That patient's already got an ulcer. So we're going to get rid of that. Three, frequent glasses of milk. Want to know what milk does? Milk makes the stomach produce even more hydrochloric acid. So no, we don't want that. We're going to get rid of that. Then we have four, unlimited decaffeinated coffee. I don't care if it's decaffeinated, still has a little bit of what in it? Caffeine, right? And those are no-nos for patients with ulcers. So the only good choice here are the green vegetables. When teaching the parents of toddler about safe finger, safe finger foods, the nurse suggests trying which of the following? One, nuts. Two, popcorn. Three, Cheerios. Or four, hot dogs. And the correct answer is Cheerios. Why? I want you to think about it. That toddler, you want to give them finger food because they're not going to sit down and eat. They want to run around, right? But you give a toddler finger food, they put it in their mouth. What does the Cheerios do? What does the, Cheerios do the minute it goes in their mouth. It starts to dissolve. Why? The enzymes that are on the tongue. The enzymes on the tongue starts to dissolve the Cheerios immediately. The Cheerios doesn't have to wait to get to the stomach to be digested. It starts right there, right? It just dissolves. So it's going to be harder for that patient to choke. But let's look at our other choices. One, nuts. Nuts don't dissolve at all, guys. You eat that nut, you chew it, and guess what? You go to the bathroom and it comes out. It comes out. Okay, so that's going to be easy for a toddler where the windpipe's only this small for them to get stuck here in their throat and for them to choke. You have two popcorn, same thing. Popcorn does not digest 100%. You eat it, it's going to come in and come out, right? So it can choke in their throat as well. And of course, the hot dogs, and especially the parents, you teach the parents hot dogs are choking hazards. But if you have to give your kids hot dogs, how do you teach the parents to cut it up? In triangles. Why? Because the hot dogs are circular. And what happens when the child swallows it? The circular, it might get lodged right here in their throat. And there's no way for air to get through. But if you teach the parents to cut it up in triangles, even if it gets stuck in their throat, since it's a triangle shape, outside of that triangle, at least a little bit of air is getting through while you're calling 911. Preferably no hot dogs, but if mother insists, at least teach her to cut it up in triangles. But the best food to prevent choking is a Cheerio because it dissolves immediately. We don't have to worry about it getting um, being stuck um, in the patient's throat. A nasogastric tube is inserted in order for the client to receive intermittent tube feedings. An initial chest x-ray examination is done to confirm placement of the tube in the stomach. After the x-ray confirmation, the most reliable method for checking for tube placement is to one, place the end of the tube in water and observe for bubbling. Two, auscultate while introducing air into the tube. Three, measure the pH of the client's secretions aspirated. Or four, ask the client to speak. And you guys all know what this answer is. Is three, you're going to measure the pH. And like I said, you wanted the pH to be very low because um, the content that's in the stomach should be very, very, very acidic. Okay. From zero to about four is uh, the SIG number. Some books say 4.2, um, but that's around where you want it to be so you can make sure that you're in the stomach. Now, I want you to pay, pay attention to that question. It said after, after the x-ray has been checked. So um, after the patient got this in place, the first thing we do to check is the x-ray. But after that x-ray, what's the next best way? And it's checking the gastric um, residual and you do that by testing the pH. For the client who's receiving parental nutrition via a central venous catheter, the nurse recognizes that a priority is to one, use sterile technique during the administration of the feedings, Two, maintain the initial infusion rate at no more than 40 to 60 ml per hour. Three, complete the administration of the feeding within 12 hours. Or four, have radiographic confirmation of the placement of the catheter. 
Now, guys, I've rammed this down your throat. I'm not even going to give you a minute to think of the answer. You should know what it is. The correct answer is four. You want an x-ray to show the placement. Okay, guys? That's going to be a priority. Let's look at our other choices. You have one, use a sterile technique. Well, for this, you don't need sterile technique. You just need aseptic technique, so that's wrong. Two, maintain the initial infusion rate at no more than 40 to 60 mLs per hour. At the beginning, you do want it to 40 to 60 mLs per hour, but then you're going to gradually increase that number, okay? Number three, complete the administration of the feeding within 12 hours. Well, here's the thing. The feedings, you never want that bag, bag to hang more than 24 hours. Now, if it's fat, emulsion, lipids, no more than 12. Okay, so it depends on what you're giving. All right. Like I said, if it's fatty content, such as lipids, no more than 12. Otherwise, it can hang for 24 hours, no more than 24 hours. But regardless, your priority is placement. Because guess what? If you don't have placement, would you be giving the feedings anyway? No, you wouldn't. So the correct answer is four. You're going to check that x-ray. Guys, I'm so proud of myself. I did this under 30 minutes. That was our last question. I hope you enjoyed this um, segment on nutrition. I have a feeling because you guys have been doing this lately. Every video I do, you guys say you want more and more and more. So most likely I'll be doing a second part on nutrition. If I don't get any comments on it, I'll just keep it moving. Anyway. Do not forget, my next review is going to be August 29th and 30th. If you know anybody who needs a review, don't forget, let your friend know about it. They can check out www.nexusnursinginstitute.com for information on how to register. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time.